After three weeks of heavy bombing, Syrian government forces have managed to splinter the rebel-held enclave of eastern Ghouta. It's the regime's deepest push into the eastern suburbs of Damascus. A huge blow for opposition fighters still vowing not to surrender. The regime has cut Ghouta into three parts by cutting the main roads linking them. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, the regime has seized the main highway that links the region's largest city, Douma, to the town of Harasta further west. They've also captured the town of Mesraba in the south. Ghouta, which has been under government siege since 2013, is the last remaining opposition-controlled zone on the outskirts of the capital. Douma was a refuge for many residents fleeing the government's advance in other towns. It's also the main bastion for the Islamist group Jaish al-Islam. Meanwhile, to the north in Idlib, humanitarian workers protested the escalating violence in the region. People have been killed for seven years and it's time for the international community to take action and stop these crimes which constitute horrible crimes against the humanity and international law. More than 40,000 civilians are still trapped in eastern Ghouta, which suffers acute food and medical supply shortages. Fighting has delayed and impeded aid convoys in recent days as the regime's campaign to evacuate rebel fighters and their families takes off. The first batch of foreign bank militants and their families has left the besieged enclave in the eastern fringes of Syria's capital, Damascus. Our Syria correspondent Mohamed Ali updated us on the situation in the battered Damascus suburb of eastern Ghouta. The recent development was the uh, exit of uh, 13 uh, Nusra Front terrorists from eastern al Ghouta via the al Waqidin uh, camp. Of course, they used the humanitarian uh, corridor, which was established by the Syrian army and the Russian uh, uh, military uh, uh, over there on the outskirts of uh, eastern al Ghouta. Now, regarding uh, this uh, exit, uh, what happened was that uh, only 13 Nusra Front terrorists uh, got out from eastern al Ghouta, particularly from Douma. Those terrorists are affiliated with the al-Nusra Front, and they were prisoners uh, uh, in the jails of uh, the so-called Jaysh al-Islam uh, uh, terrorist group in eastern al Ghouta, which is considered by the West as a so-called moderate opposition group. The Jaysh al-Islam uh, uh, militant group uh, issued a statement regarding that, saying that following uh, negotiations and talks between those uh, military commanders uh, armed com uh, of the armed group of uh, the Jaysh al-Islam and uh, the UN, uh, uh, which of course entered uh, uh, inside eastern al Ghouta while delivering aid uh, uh, today over there. Following such discussions, the Jaysh al-Islam decided to uh, uh, release those uh, Nusra terrorists uh, from uh, its jails in Douma and allow them to exit, to be bussed out towards Idlib uh, with uh, a number of their, uh, uh, of course, members of their families. Well, we have talked to managing editor of Veterans Today, Jim W. Dean. He believes that the evacuation of anti-Damascus militants shows the Syrian government is honoring its commitments under a peace deal. Really, we don't really know whether this is an indication because these are not fighters that really kind of gave up their arms and decided to quit fighting. Uh, but it is a start. It uh, does show that the, uh, the others that are there, uh, that Syria <clears throat> is uh, honoring their pledge that they will take people out to uh, Idlib. And of course, the Syrian army has always been very careful at not wanting to waste the lives of its soldiers. Uh, they don't want to fight to the death, uh, killing all these jihadis in this uh, <clears throat> eastern Ghouta because they know a lot more of their own people will be killed and they need them to fight in other places. So they've always uh, given these amnesties uh, for jihadis to quit, uh, take their families and exit and go up to Idlib, uh, where there's arms uh, waiting for them to continue fighting if they want. Uh, but <clears throat> it gets them out of Damascus and uh, tying up Syrian troops there, fighting them and having to man the lines in the areas that they're in, and gives the uh, a Syrian army more freedom of movement, which is going to be critical to, to them to really try to stamp out uh, the last strongholds of ISIS and now uh, these other jihadi groups.
Ghouta is coming back into the hands of the Syrian government. A strategic territory close to the seat of power, Western outrage erupted when Syria began an offensive to retake it, including emergency Security Council meetings and accusations of chemical weapons use. Syria has given up its chemical weapons while militants still possess them. Syria has opened up daily humanitarian corridors which militants attack, blocking anyone from leaving, essentially using civilians as human shields. What then is with these double standards in Syria? Join me, Wakarazui, as we discuss Eastern Ghouta. Let's firstly cross over to our correspondent who is joining us live now from Damascus, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad, what more can you tell us about the latest out of Eastern Ghouta? Yes, the latest is that the Syrian army has edged closer towards accomplishing the first uh, goal of this offensive against terrorists in eastern al Ghouta, which uh, started uh, last month. The Syrian army was able to cut major supply lines for terrorists that links them uh, between uh, the areas they control in the towns and villages in eastern al Ghouta, like Duma and Harasta, Arbin, Zamalka and Ain Terma. The army was able to uh, almost nearly 99% split uh, eastern al Ghouta in half in order to cut the supply lines of the terrorists there and continues to advance and impose a siege on each town that the terrorists control uh, over there inside eastern al Ghouta in order to later on defeat the, the terrorists inside like the Al-Nusra Front, Faylaq al-Rahman and other groups that fight alongside this uh, terrorist organization. There are, there are also humanitarian corridors still being opened to, of course, on a daily basis, one in Al-Mleha, one in Al-Wafidin camp on the outskirts of al Ghouta. So far, civilians were not uh, able to get out because terrorists continue to block them from exiting eastern al Ghouta. Army commanders uh, on the ground say they want uh, that those terrorists uh, can want to continue use the civilians as human shields as they have been doing so for the past uh, seven years and that the Syrian army, however, uh, is carrying out this military operation for two uh, uh, goals. The first, save the uh, Syrians, the, the civilians inside eastern al Ghouta from the uh, uh, suffering over there because of the terrorist occupation and also save the citizens and the uh, residents of Damascus uh, government-held areas uh, from the mortar being fired uh, almost on a daily basis from eastern al Ghouta. This is the priority now of the Syrian government, which is purging eastern al Ghouta of terrorists. And so far, the Syrian army has been successful in advancing rapidly and significantly. Uh, uh, the recent developments was that the army took control of Misraba and is just less than one uh, kilometer from uh, splitting eastern al Ghouta in half. All right, Mohammed, we'll leave there at that. But of course, as always, we appreciate your reporting for us. Our guests for tonight's discussion are the founder and director of NASIS, uh, Mr. Ammar Rakaf, who is joining us live from London. And we're also joined by a professor at George Washington University, Professor Nabil Mikhail, who is joining us live from Washington, D.C. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Uh, professor Mikhail, I'll start with you. Uh, how important do you think uh, the Syrian army's gains are in eastern Ghouta have? Uh, do you think anti-Assad forces essentially being defeated? Uh, greetings to you, to the distinguished audience, and to the uh, honorable guest. Um, I think it is significant and it is important because uh, the media in the West um, describes Al Ghouta as a suburb of Damascus. So, if it is a suburb of Damascus, and everyone knows that Damascus is the capital of the Arab Republic of Syria, to regain control of that uh, important area will be to boost uh, a very important stronghold to your uh, strategic assets. I will uh, be as neutral as I can, so I'm just going to re recall or view the conflict as um, a, a play among different contenders. So definitely the senior army uh, backed by the Russians made gains. There were many losses, we regret this. But I think now it is time uh, for the Russian military to do some sort of a process of introspection. Uh, they have been in Syria for a little over two and a half years. Um, they have uh, really participated um, actively and directly in many battles. So I think if Al Ghouta is sealed for the uh, pro-government Syrian army, uh, perhaps the Russians uh, may start now thinking about the other face in the battle. I do not think there will be a big battle similar to Al Ghouta in the near future. Uh, so it is time really to prepare some sort of a peace plan for Syria. I think Russia will advise the Syrian government to put more effort into the peace process now going on at different forums, at different locales, whether in Astana, Kazakhstan, or Geneva, or whatever. So perhaps uh, the next step after Al Ghouta will be um, 
some uh, strong uh, support for the diplomatic process uh, going on to establish peace and end the civil war in Syria. The second thing is more intriguing and kind of puzzling. I'm also trying to assess how the Al Ghota battles will relate to the announcements we have been hearing about some American rapprochement with North Korea. Because if East Asia is stable, America will pay more attention to East Asia, which uh, for this program will be mainly Syria. So I think perhaps mm -hmm. the Russians are trying to read the American strategic steps. Are they going to, to get more involved in Syria? Are they going to uh, basically uh, try to right. uh, see other uh, front lines for a potential conflict with the government of Syria or its uh, supporters, whether militia or the Russian military advisors? So I think, as I said, it is time for introspection and mm -hmm. perhaps an examination of the Russian record can help every side, including Russia itself, promote peace and end the fight as soon as possible. Okay, so Mr. Wakaf, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on Eastern Ghouta and, and what it means, because you know it's obviously a strategic territory, it's this close to the seat of power uh, of, of the uh, President Assad government. Um, and secondly, um, you know, why should we at this point, or should we be, let me put it this way, talk, be talking about peace uh, if you know, really the Syrian army has the upper hand? Why is it only when that occurs that the talk for peace is that much more important? Well, first of all, it is hugely important. This has been going on, this odd situation, so to speak, has been going on for about five years now, uh, or even six, well, five and a half, <clears throat> uh, whereby the people of Damascus really didn't feel secure at all. There are still other places like uh, Mukhayyam and Yermuk uh, and, and so on and so forth, Hajar al Aswad, uh, tiny places southern of Damascus. but. They're quite quiet, so to speak. They're not um, having any uh, ideas, the militants in there, they're not having any ideas of expansion, they're not threatening neighborhoods with mortar shells and so on. They're just keeping there still. So they're not really affecting the neighborhoods around. Whilst with the Ghouta, they have the clear intention of invading Damascus, and um, they've attempted so quite a few times, and there is the continuous, almost sometimes daily shelling of the capital. So the people of Damascus have been uh, pretty much under this uncertainty and insecure situation for a while now. And it's very important um, for the government to secure the capital. And it's time it did so. Um, they've tried some uh, reconciliation attempts. However, there is some inner fighting within Al Ghuta itself between factions like Jish al Islam versus Faylaq al Rahman, the main two factions. Uh, they apparently don't like each other much, and this has scuffed the attempt which was made in June uh, with the Russian and Egyptian mediation. So the only way to do it, basically, is to clear this area from militants. And apparently the government is uh, trying to do the same that it did in eastern Aleppo. Um, there is a bit of siege, um, then the army goes in, the area and the militants collapse, and then the militants are shifted elsewhere, and people go back to their normal life, as indeed happened in eastern Aleppo. Um, and the significance, because this is the capital, and of course, as in Aleppo, the second city, the industrial capital of Syria, um, this is very significant and huge towards reassessing, uh, sorry, re-establishing and reasserting um, the legitimacy of the Syrian state, um, which gives it a long shot in terms of saying, um, and a lot of saying, obviously, but with what to do next and, um, you know, their position at the negotiating table, mm -hmm. their position vis-a-vis -vis regional um, powers and states and obviously the West as well. Um, in terms of um, your second question, it was what, uh, the peace? I don't think peace is near. Um, there are, uh, well, first of all, we need to understand that those militants do not really represent themselves. Um, we can think of them better as proxy fighters. And um, mm -hmm. once we realize that, we understand that there are certain regional uh, states and international powers who do not want them to surrender. Uh, had it been for themselves, probably 
um, they would have laid arms to save their houses, their uh, families, and so on, their right. people. But regional powers probably would want to, uh, to continue with this crisis for as long as possible to try to extract whatever uh, concessions from the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. So this is likely to drag on. We still have Idlib, and let's not forget the American project in northeastern Syria. Um, there is a threat of um, division over mm -hmm. there, dividing Syria east of the Euphrates, uh, establishing a quasi-state over there, and so on and so forth. So it's going to be a long time before we uh, really can uh, think of peace. Okay, so Professor, you know, I'm glad Mr. Rokhav brought up that point about, you know, uh, the fact that there has uh, been outrage, really, ever since uh, the Syrian army uh, has been trying to liberate uh, Eastern Wuta. There's been outrage in the form of Security Council meetings, um, uh, chemical weapons use allegations. Um, is it all, do you think, Professor, um, what Mr. Rokhav alluded to there, that this is essentially those who have supported these militants really trying desperately to hold on to anything really in Syria. Perhaps that could be true. Uh, there is uh, support for some of the old factions that have been opposed to Assad a long time. But also the question of chemical weapons is very sensitive, although in this case it was not uh, proven similar to uh, the debate back in April 2017 and earlier in September, August of 2013. Uh, but at the heart of the debate over the actions in al Ghota was basically many questions about Russia's purposes in Syria. So I think that perhaps was the most important dilemma for many people who denounced the actions. It came right after the Turkish army swiftly moved into northern Syria and then uh, the Syrian army was mobilized with the help of the Russians and some militias to occupy parts of the um, heavily Kurdish populated area where Turkey sent troops. Then Al Ghota, uh, Eastern Ghota exploded suddenly. So I think the action itself was the biggest challenge to every uh, defensive plan by NATO, by um, every country involved. Frankly, I myself did not expect the fight in El Gota to erupt in that manner, but what we have heard that there were militants inside. So there was a lot of fear that El Gota scenario would be repeated. Uh, the Syrian army backed by the Russians would move to another area because there are other terrorist elements that have, that have to be purged. So I think the West was worried, not just because there could be some funding for some of these uh, people who received money uh, from the Obama administration, although actually to his credit Trump defunded these groups and stopped the CIA missions, but they were afraid that there could, that Al Ghota could be a double loss after a, the fiasco or the debacle over mm -hmm. the Turkish army move. And they were, all of, they were always um, uh, apprehensive about the repetition of that scenario. A swift move by Syrian troops toward other urban centers, because Al Ghota is an urban area, whereby major fighting could happen. So this is why Al Ghota assumed a bigger size, strategically speaking, than its size, uh, than right. its um, uh, contours warranted. Okay, so Mr. Wakaf, you know, I wanted to concentrate just for a moment on uh, these allegations of chemical weapons use because, you know, this keeps coming up over and over again uh, in Syria specifically. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, uh, the Syrian government says and claimed today that over 140 letters have been sent to both the Security Council of the United Nations as well as the OPCW regarding uh, the fact that militants do have um, uh, chemical weapons themselves, but those, according to the Syrian government, have essentially been ignored at this time. Um, that's a bit of a double standard, isn't it? Because if um, the West and the international community is really worried genuinely about the use of chemical weapons in Syria, that they would look into those accusations just as fervently as they look into their own accusations of chemical weapons used by the Syrian government, wouldn't they? Have to look into accusations uh as it is the case, because so far every single allegation of um, use, you couldn't have a clear cut 
no culprit or there is no smoking gun and so on. Um, you can really point a straight finger and you could argue, uh, is it, you know, um, you know, bomb some chemicals, some uh, neighborhood with chemical weapons for two or three people, difficulties and three others to suffocate or whatever, when it can easily or it could easily bro uh, drop a bomb and, and kill why, why would they know effectivity chemical weapons like chlorine, which is, has been, uh, you know, effectively been mentioned time and again? We have clear evidence. Um, in fact, a, a sort of, uh, uh, you know, declaration or um, how do you say, uh, somebody who has um, acknowledged usage of chemical weapons and none other than Jaysh al-Islam, which is the main two main factions in East. They had some fighting units uh, in Aleppo and during the siege of Aleppo, during the besieging stage of Aleppo on the 7th of April, 19, uh, sorry, 2016, there was a chemical attack, chlorine gas attack, Sheikh Maqsoud Air, and the video is there, there is a yellow cloud, a bluff uh, going up. And then after that attack, it was said that Jaysh al-Islam uh, carried out the attack and then Jaysh al-Islam issued a statement saying, well, one of our commanders in Aleppo um, used an author uh, weapon. So, so they acknowledged there is a weapon, but he, un he, was un he wasn't authorized to use it, breaking whatever uh, combat regulations and so on and so forth. So <laughs> we have this faction acknowledging um, you know that there is that there, that they have such weapons and there are rules of engagement that mark and nobody's talking about it so they're clearly not looking at chemical weapons and um, whether they could you know be uh, of a humanitarian issue or whatever they just want to incriminate the Syrian government and put pressure on it uh, no matter what so it's not double standard one standard drive traffic against the Syrian government as much as you can. Professor, what do you make of that? Because, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei today, Professor, spoke about uh, these accusations of chemical weapons use uh, against, for example, the Syrian government possibly using them, uh, saying they listen, uh, you know, um, the West has no morality when it comes to this issue. Uh, during the 1980s war by Saddam Hussein against Iran, Saddam used chemical weapons against the Iranian peoples. Those uh, chemical weapons were supplied to Saddam by the likes of Germany and others. And the rest of the world, of course, turned a blind eye to a lot of those atrocities. Um, so, you know, who really is the West to be pointing fingers at anybody, A, and B, then, you know, why not have then clear investigations about these things, which we know have not been able to occur? Um, look, the uh, GOTA operations started or coincided with reports in the American press that the government of Syria received shipment from North Korea that had some chemical agents. However, when you mention something as important as um, uh, chemical weapons, you have to um, basically investigate the matter. You have to bring evidence. But in my opinion, the um, Trump administration did not want to push it hard because they felt that there were other developments that basically superseded or transcended these accusations. And also, I think at that moment, they were preparing for we did not know about it because it was secretly done. They were preparing for some major detente, uh, big opening to the North Korean. So here, politics were, uh, was a factor in uh, basically uh, devaluing or in putting less emphasis on uh, the Syrians' uh, use of chemical weapons. But the biggest problem for me is the bigger strategic picture. Basically, what will come after Al Ghota, and is Al Ghota going to be a model, not for a debate or controversies or co over chemical weapons, but for swift um, commando operations whereby a heavy bombardment campaign can try to eliminate some elements that have to be removed uh, in the middle of a big urban population. This is basically, I think, what the Pentagon is thinking about. 
Will there be more battles in areas the Syrian regime judges as still um, hazardous because of a um, uh, terrorism threat? This is the big challenge, not chemical weapons. Okay, so Mr. Wakaf, uh, let, let's talk about that then. What happens then post uh, Huta, uh, once that is, uh, when, whenever that, that occurs, when it's fully liberated and cleared of mm -hmm. these militants, what happens then? Because you know, we know Idlib is possibly a huge area uh, which will need to be tackled at some point in time. Then we have um, the Turkish offensive in Afrin slash Manbij occurring there as well, and U.S. forces um, you know, situated in that area as well. Um, wh what do you make of those battlefields and how important they will be? Well, let's think of the Syrian population in those areas, like, for example, in Al-Ghuta, there is also the northern Homs and, and southern Hama, there is a bit of enclave over there, there is Dar'a, there is Idlib. The Syrian population over there, we mistakenly think that they are look anti-Assad, they want freedom, whatever, but these are hostages. They, they cannot get out of their houses um, and, for example, move on to government-controlled areas because they will be shot at. Uh, look at Ghouta, for example. Um, despite uh, attempts, for the past five years, the only attempt uh, for civilians to get out of, of Ghouta, despite being besieged, was about uh, two years ago uh, with some 4,000, or actually three years ago with some 4,000 civilians, uh, because the faction, um, the militant faction that was controlling their neighborhood decided to surrender weapons. And there, yeah, there you have it, they, they went into um, government control areas and the government took care of them and so on and so forth. Otherwise, people are not allowed to go out. So the Syrian government has this duty to go and free people from um, uh, militants who want to liberate Andalusia again or do whatever um, you know, this great deed to go into heaven and so on. These ideologies, people are tired, they want to go back uh, to uh, um, bring their kids back to school, bring their um, kids back to hospitals and so on and so forth. So it is the duty of the Syrian government to ensure all that. Now, what we understand the situation is that the Syrian government um, has certain priorities. You know, um, if, for example, the, a battle in Idlib would cost a lot and it would take uh, uh, such a long time, then probably let's do another place, just like what's happening now in Ghouta, secure that and then use that as a platform to launch onto uh, other places mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So this will continue um, regardless of, we, we don't know exactly yet what the uh, geographic priorities are, but most importantly, and I think it would be those that are more digestible uh, and, you know, uh, where the government can secure right. a victory will come first. Okay, we'll leave there at that. Unfortunately, the clock has gotten the best of us, but of course, we do appreciate both of your contributions to tonight's discussion. That was founder and director of NASIS, Mr. Ammar Wakaf, who was speaking to us live from London. And we were also joined by a professor at George Washington University, Mr. Nabil Mikhail, who had been speaking to us live from Washington, D.C. And of course, viewers, we appreciate you joining us as well. Until next time, good night.